Um, not only will next year be our 10 year anniversary of holding this, it's also going to be our 30 years anniversary of a GIS program in this parish. So we're going to we're going to try to raise the bar a little bit next year. So I want all of you to come back, please. Um, we have. Four speakers tonight, actually five. I didn't realize my director was going to do a, a little talk too. So while we're at our, our break, he's going to go over a few things about some of our other digital resources here at, in the city of Baton Rouge. Um, I failed to mention this, but my name is Warren Crone. I'm the GIS manager of uh, the city, the city parish's GIS program. And I work with a fine group of people right across the, the walkway here in, in City Hall. Um, so again, welcome to you all. I'm so happy to, to have you here. Um, in case nobody or you didn't know, Artemis One launched early this morning, and I, I think uh, I think NASA was just holding out to do this on GIS Day myself. Uh, so this is awesome. We're, we're making our first steps, getting back to the moon. Um, nine hours after Artemis launched and an Orion separated, sent back this picture of Earth uh, from space. And it's been a long time since we have seen something like that, right? Um, puts things in, per in perspective. So speaking of Earth, there's a lot of other cities and states and countries across the planet that are holding an a GIS Day event today. Um, actually, there was there's five right here in the Baton Rouge area. I know one across the river in Port Allen that's going to be held tomorrow night, and uh, four others that were being held here in Baton Rouge today. So, um, I think whatever we're doing is working, right? If you're new to GIS and this is just something that caught your attention, we have a gallery at uh, the main library where um, we have this whole uh, wall exhibit right when you walk into the uh, foyer area where the, um, the desk is to check in and check out books. Please go by and uh, check it out. It'll be up for the entire month of November. Um, you can learn a little bit about everything concerning GIS, remote sensing technology and such. A little history involved, so please check that out. Now here's a, a lineup tonight. My coworker, uh, the newest member of our team, uh, Mickey Broussard, is going to talk about lightning strike data. This is something he did as part of his uh, thesis at LSU, uh, and he's going to do a, a presentation about it here for us. Then, a um, friend from my alma mater, Brendan Harmon uh, from the Louisiana State University School of Landscape Architecture, is going to talk about uh, temporal GIS and drone data. Another friend that came all the way from Texas to be with us tonight, Ana Rodriguez from Esri, uh, to talk about ArcGIS Hub, and then I, uh, myself to wrap things up, just give you a few updates of what we've been doing uh, with GIS here in City Parish. So, everybody, enjoy yourselves. Mickey, you're up first. Uh, looking at lightning strike data in uh, in a portion of South Central Louisiana and uh, seeing how it correlates to the urban heat island effect and also pollution and uh, particulate matter uh, data from the Louisiana Department of Environment and Quality. So let's get started. Oh, I'll do it that way. There we go. Okay, so starting uh, talking about lightning-based hazards. Uh, so cloud-to-ground lightning strikes, which is what we usually think of when we talk about lightning, uh, are the are some of the most common, potentially devastating uh, natural hazards that uh, we see. And like I said, you know, very common. They can also trigger further events like wildfires or what we call natec hazards. Uh, natec hazards are when you have a technical hazard that's triggered by like a natural event. So like a night lightning strike hitting uh, a refinery and causing some kind of like chemical spill or uh, 
uh, equipment failure or something like that leading to some kind of toxic thing being released. That would be what we call an ATEC hazard triggered by lightning. Uh, and the risk for strike, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more as I go on, is actually increased by heavy pollution. Uh, and so Louisiana is actually a kind of an interesting point for these risks because uh, not only do we, as we know, because we live here, see uh, a lot of lightning activity and a lot of thunderstorm activity over the course of the year, we also have a lot of uh, pollution in the year. We have a lot of industrial production that happens in our state. Uh, and so given this increased risk, uh, being able to predict individual strikes would be would be particularly useful. But the problem is with individual strike prediction, as I know in the last point, these forecasts are difficult to produce because the process that leads to lightning generation and uh, electrical charging and cumulonimbus nimbus clouds is very, very complicated, very computationally taxing. Uh, so we can't necessarily build out a physical model like we do with uh, some other things that we do in numerical weather prediction uh, we have to sort of look to other methods. So continuing on that vein, uh, I want to talk a little bit about how these lightning, uh, how lightning is produced and how thunderstorms develop. So the primary way that you can think of thunderstorms developing, uh, they basically form when warm, moist air rises into colder, dry air aloft, right? So any kind of lift that's going to take that warm, moist air from near the surface here and lift it higher into the troposphere, that's going to cause a cloud to build. As that cloud builds, sorry, I got to talk into the microphone, sorry. Uh, as that cloud builds, uh, we are going to see raindrops start to form and those charges are going to separate as it builds and builds. Uh, generally, the lift that starts this is caused by either unequal heating at the Earth's surface, uh, some kind of topology, like if the air runs into a mountain, or uh, if winds sort of converge at the surface of the Earth. So if you imagine two winds kind of running and hitting each other, they're going to force each other up, right? Um, in very basic terms, what happens as that cloud builds is those, uh, is ice and grapple, which is very soft hail, starts to run into each other within the cloud. And when it collides, it generates a charge. Uh, as that charge builds and builds, the grapple, the, the soft hail is heavier, so it's going to move to the bottom of the cloud. The ice is going to move to the top of the puck because it's, uh, lighter. And that's going to cause a charge separation because one of those is going to have a negative charge, one is going to have a positive charge. But the problem is that there's all these collisions happening, and it's a lot of different little particles all hitting each other within the cloud. And the magnitude that each of those collisions generate is very variable. So like I said earlier, the simulating this process either in a physical environment in a laboratory or in a computer model is very difficult to, uh, to actually do because... It's very dependent on initial conditions and a lot of different things can happen. Um, and so that's why I think doing this in a more simplified manner and building a more simple model is so useful in terms of predicting those individual charges. Uh, and then in Louisiana, like I was saying, we're actually in the Gulf Coast. We are in probably, or we are in the area that is most uh, exposed to lightning strikes during the course of a year. Uh, the Gulf Coast sees more lightning strikes than any other region in the United States, as you can see from this first graphic. Uh, particularly in the warm season, in the summer, these storms are generally uh, forced by what we call the land-sea breeze dynamic. What that is, is the land and the, the sea, as the sun hits them, the land gets hotter a lot faster than the sea, because there's a different uh, uh, specific heat between the two of them. And so as the land gets hotter and hotter, Air is going to come in from the ocean. It's going to carry warm, moist air over the ocean. It's going to create a general uh, or a, an area of low pressure over the land, and that's going to lift the air up. So that's how land, or that's what happens with a lot of them. And particularly in Florida, you see that obviously there's a lot of lightning that happens in Florida. That land sea breeze dynamic happens on either side of the peninsula, and it lifts up as it converges in the middle. So you have a lot of very big, even stronger thunderstorms in Florida. So that's why if you go to the beach, during the summer, like it's like clockwork, like two or three o'clock, there's a thunderstorm, right? That's what's happening there. Uh -oh. Is that a problem I need to worry about? All right. I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, anyway, uh, Louisiana, our lightning is actually kind of unique um, because we, the area that we see the most lightning, if you look at the map here, is actually what we call the lightning triangle between, and sort of described by Slidell, Baton Rouge, and New Orleans. 
uh, that area is not necessarily, it's, it's pretty far inland, right? And while we have like Lake Pontchartrain and stuff and there is water there, the land sea breeze dynamic shouldn't be as, or is not pronounced there. It's not what's forcing those thunderstorms. Um, let me find my place I lost. Oh, sorry. Uh, and like this said, they're too far inland to be affected by the land sea breeze dynamic. Uh, so something else has to be either forcing those thunderstorms or when they, when that lift is generated, making them as severe as they are. Um, part of what's happening is that the climatological conditions in Louisiana are favorable for thunderstorm development all year, right? We always have a lot of warm, moist air that's here at the surface level. Uh, we always have a lot of what we call precipitable, precipitable water. Um, and uh, that's why, as you can see from the second graphic, let me move this just a little bit. Louisiana, actually, we have uh, the peak of thunderstorms during the winter months. A lot of those are forced by fronts and stuff like that, as we know from living here. But the um, we have, like I said, we have all this precipitable water year round. And with the coastline effect minimized, the enhanced convection in these areas could partially be attributed to a combination of the urban heat island effect, which I'm going to describe, and condensation nuclei provided by pollution levels, which are occurring in climatological conditions that are already favorable for thunderstorm development. So the next slide. So let's talk a little bit about urban lightning enhancement. The urban heat island uh, is it just describes the effect that happens when urban areas uh, generally experience higher temperatures than their surrounding areas because the infrastructure associated with these regions absorbs the sun's energy more readily than non-urbanized areas. So this leads to a relative low pressure over urban areas and then convection can happen as a result. Kind of similar to what's happening with the land sea breeze dynamic, but instead of land and sea, we have an urban area and a surrounding area that doesn't retain the heat as well. Um, pollution is also, uh, or excuse me, this creates an enhancement of lightning activity over heavily urbanized areas, and then pollution is also a contributing factor, as more pollution means more cloud condensation nuclei to form droplets for the cloud. And also, uh, different pollutants can actually create more charge within the droplets, uh, certain analyses have shown. So, uh, we actually see more lightning activity from more pollution. Uh, multiple studies and analyses have found some relationship between urban land use and enhanced thunderstorm initiation and intensification. Uh, however, pollution and the urban heat island alone cannot initiate a thunderstorm. You have to have that low-level moisture support that I was talking about, right? It's always hot and it's always wet unless we have a front move through. Um, additionally, the urban heat island initiated thunderstorms have been found to be more frequent in urban areas and downwind areas during weekdays, indicating that some amount of thunderstorm enhancement from pollution due to the weekly commuting cycle might be taking place. Uh, a, a study in the Chinese Pearl River Delta found that heavily polluted air can suppress the amount of solar radiation that reaches the surface in the morning, uh, which can change the thunderstorm cycle, the diurnal thunderstorm cycle, so what happens during the day, and make those thunderstorms actually happen later in the day. Uh, so these heavily polluted areas see storms that are more intense and occur later in the, air, uh, later in the day than areas with lower levels of particulate matter, Additionally, an enhancement of cloud-to-ground landing activity has been observed over and downwind of urban areas and non-urban areas with significant industrial development. Uh, so this, the analysis I'm about to talk about was uh, sort of motivated by a previous analysis uh, that I did for my thesis, which I called the shocking model, uh, where I did uh, lightning prediction from surface level measurements and pollution data where I found that the pollution variable uh, improved the model skills significantly. Um, in general, the model performance was below other models that are used today, but which was kind of expected given that I was only using surface level measurements and not satellites. But pollution data inclusion massively improved model performance overall, and some areas with heavy pollution actually saw uh, better performance than the standard. But further analysis was necessary before model performance was high enough for in the end user which motivated my current research, or the, this research, uh, which asked, can love land cover classification and hotspot analysis be used to demonstrate the urban heat island uh, enhancement of thunderstorms? So, uh, the data that I used for this analysis, I used Landsat 8, uh, here we are, excuse me. Uh, you can see this is my area of study here. Uh, it's not color corrected, but I just wanted to show the image in its original uh, form. Uh, this is south central Louisiana, 
Uh, Baton Rouge is like here-ish, and then like Lafayette's over here. Um, this Landsat image was taken April 2018 to support lightning data collected for the study period of June 2018. That's actually summer 2018, I expanded that, pardon me. Uh, and then where I got lightning data from was the Geostationary Lightning Mapper, or GLM, which is an instrument that's on the GO-16 and 17 uh, NOAA satellites. Uh, it is a, uh, basically what it does is, where am I? There I am, detects lightning activity over the Americas and adjacent oceans using a single channel near infrared optical transient detector. Uh, reports are generated at 20 second intervals and you can see they generate in these like flash counts based on how many pixels are flashing and what, uh, what the significance of that flash or those flashes are. Uh, the other method, and I'm going to not be too mathy on this, so I'll just kind of skip over this. This is what uh, I did for the hotspot analysis. This is the method for the lightning data. Uh, this statistic sort of determines whether a given cluster of high values in an area is statistically significant hotspot by noting if it is surrounded by other high values, right? Um, basically, it's going to spit out a z-score, which is anything greater than three is going to tell you that there's a hotspot representing a 99% confidence level. All right. Uh, then for the uh, land cover classification, uh, I used an unsupervised classification method. Uh, unsupervised, which shows in, in favor of supervised. Basically, the difference between those with unsupervised classification, you don't tell the computer what any of the pixels represent when it's looking at them. It's just going to classify them based on what they look like and then give them to you and you label them. Uh, the user labels them after the fact. Uh, obviously, this is... Uh, creates the advantage of allowing labels to be placed after analysis, but the disadvantage of it can produce less accurate results, which I'm actually gonna to touch on as we move forward. Um, so these were the land cover classes. This is uh, the image post color correction. Uh, I think this is before, yeah, this is prior to uh, some of the roster processing that I did, but these are the classes. You see forest, agriculture, grass, marshland, urban, and water. Uh, and these are the sort of roster processing steps that I did in RGIS Pro in order to create a more consistent image. Uh, so majority filter, what that does is just removes single misclassified cells. Boundary clean smooths the boundaries between classes uh, and can expand and shrink boundaries in larger zones, can kind of take over some of the smaller zones. Uh, region group uses, uh, assigns a unique identifier to each region in the roster. A region is any contiguous group of cells of the same value. And then Sentinel and Nibble, what, it do, what those do sort of together, they look for any area that's less than 100 pixels and sort of says those aren't real and let's, let's areas around them sort of take them over. All right. Uh, and so you can see here the results of these steps, how you get a much more consistent image, especially in the forest image or the forest areas. They're a lot more consistent. There's a lot fewer little areas of like small grass pixels and stuff in the middle of them. Uh, and so the final roster, um, overall, improve, uh, overall, you have an overall accuracy improvement and uh, improvement across each group uh, of classification. But there is still this remaining problem where a lot of this area here in the West, you can see is classified as agriculture. And a lot of, or excuse me, is classified as urban. And a lot of that is actually agriculture. Uh, there are fields that present to satellite imagery and they look kind of gray. And so the machine can kind of misidentify them as urban uh, land use when in fact they're agriculture. Uh, so that was kind of what I was talking about with some of the risk of using unsupervised classification as opposed to supervised. Uh, and so overlaying the hotspots uh, and looking at them by region type, you can see that uh, urban uh, hotspots were the most prevalent, and actually that is even more significant when you normalize them by percent area in the region. You see that urban is by far the most, uh, along with grass, for that group uh, because of the amount of area. It has a relatively small amount of area per number of hotspots. Uh, and so just going region by region here and looking at some of the areas uh, in the analysis. First, Baton Rouge. Um, you can see that there's sort of three clusters uh, for the hotspots in Baton Rouge. Uh, this is sort of the downtown area. Um, oh, I should have oriented you guys on the map here. I'm sorry. This is the Mississippi River, as you could probably guess, and then the Atchafalaya, and you can see, like, this is Baton Rouge, False River, Lafayette's down here, and then, like, the I-10 corridor. 
is like running through like right here, just to kind of give you guys an idea. Um, anyway, back to what I was saying. This is the southern cluster here. This is sort of downtown. This is near Exxon. Um, and then the right area is kind of out towards central a little bit. And then continuing Lafayette here, these areas here in the north are around the I-10 cluster, or around the I-10 corridor. The top two are near Karen Crow. There's a lot of oil and gas development there. Uh, the bottom two are actually, or excuse me, these guys here are um, between Lafayette and Rain, a cluster around the I-10 corridor. These are the ones that are up near Karen Crow. These guys are actually a little weird. They don't quite fit the uh, what I expected with the analysis. Um, they uh, they actually are between the Lafayette and the Abbeville area, so they're not necessarily a lot of urban heat island stuff expected there, nor a lot of pollution expected there. Uh, and then the final ones, Chack Bay Homa and Ville Platte. Uh, Chack Bay Homa, these guys are based along the corridor uh, between Homa, the main corridor between Homa and New Orleans. There's also oil and gas development there. And then Ville Platte, uh, there is some oil and gas development in Pine Prairie nearby. So the overall conclusions, uh, land cover classification uh, model alone does demonstrate the correlation with lightning hotspot activity. But there are problems with the urban agricultural interpretation of the model that could potentially limit its utility as a predictive tool. And the resolution of the urban agricultural problem and integration with pollution data are recommended as further analysis to strengthen the method. Um, and I lost my train of thought. So yeah, that's it. <laughs> Anyone have a question? Yes, sir. During the pandemic, did you see any correlation with the decreased um, pollution activity in the area? You know, that would be, I, so I have not done that analysis. I was looking, all of the, the lightning data I looked at were pre-pandemic. Uh, they were all 2018, 2019. That would be an interesting analysis to conduct, especially because when I was conducting, the pandemic was still ongoing, actually. So they probably wouldn't have really, but now that we're after it, that would be a very interesting angle to take, I think. Because, yeah, you're probably right there. There would be some level of, uh, you would see that enhancement sort of diminished as a result of lower pollution. Do you think the grass um, have been affected because of the dew point and higher moisture? Um, it could have been. So I think probably um, what happened there also is that there's a lot of what the satellite would identify and the model would identify as grass that's in sort of urbanish areas. Because, um, you know, like there's backyards and there's things like that, especially in an area like Louisiana. And I, I I think if you look only at the area that's affected by the urban heat island, like if you drew a ringer out of it, which is another uh, analysis that I was going to do, but is not included here, uh, I think you might see that kind of be a little bit more pronounced and that grass area would be mostly areas that are within those uh, those urban heat island affected areas or areas that have otherwise some kind of enhanced uh, pollution. Yes, sir. Are you looking at a uh, cloud-to-cloud lightning or cloud? Uh... So the, uh, yeah, so the, the, I was, but GLM data doesn't uh, allow you to separate between cloud-to-ground lightning and cloud-to-cloud -cloud lightning. So it's, it's all lightning activity, total lightning activity is, is included in the study here. Yeah. All right, I'm done. I'm in a landscape architecture, and I'm going to talk about temporal GIS um, and I'll use a case study using drone data um, to explain explain what it is. So, of course, um, GIS is developed to work with spatial data, um, but sometimes we need to deal with time as well. Um, so the uh, free open source GIS, uh, GRASS GIS, developed by the Army Corps originally and now um, 
developed by a large open source community around the world, um, has developed a temporal framework for working with spatial and temporal data. Um, what, it, what it has is a database for um, working with time series of spatial data. Um, and there are temporal data sets that can be um, rasters, vectors, 3D rasters and 3D vectors. So it can handle essentially four dimensions. Um, and there's um, algorithms for processing it, visualizing and converting temporal data as well as spatial data. Um, so the most important thing is having a space-time data set. So this is implemented in GRASS as um, a, um, in addition to having the, the spatial data, there's also a temporal database that stores um, timestamps and temporal metadata um, for each map. And a series of spatial data of maps are registered into a temporal data set, a space-time data set, uh, which can be raster, vector, 3D vector, or 3D raster. Um, algorithms for processing temporal data include gap filling, um, so filling gaps in time, uh, interpolating between missing, uh, missing dates, aggregation, so turning days um, into weeks, weeks into months, aggregating months into years, and so forth, um, accumulating data across time, temporal algebra, so very much like map algebra, um, but map algebra across time. Uh, temporal queries, um, statistics across time, and of course, um, visualization, plotting, and animation. Um, so to give you an idea of how this can be used, um, I'm going to present a case study that we've done um, using uh, drone surveys. Um, the nice thing about drones is it's relatively easy to go out and survey a site multiple times. Um, the overhead's a lot lower to go out and do a repeat survey. So we've been flying um, over Hilltop Arboretum um, here in Baton Rouge. Um, so they've been establishing um, a Cajun Prairie wildflower meadow and to study how it's evolving, how it develops as they start to establish it. Um, we've been flying monthly surveys um, with a fixed wing drone uh, with a multispectral sensor. So obviously we're collecting 12 months of data, for example, with the drone, um, and we're building up a time series. So we start with bare ground um, in January, and the meadow um, will build up its biomass, um, reaching a peak in the summer, and then declining into the fall and the winter. Um, so by monitoring it with a drone, um, we can study the accumulation of biomass and its dieback, and thus um, the carbon flux in the meadow. Um, we're doing this using Metashape um, for the drone photogrammetry um, and Python um, to take the, um, the photogrammetry data, ingest it into GRASS GIS, and then automate all of the processing so that we can make this really efficient because we're doing, we're processing a lot of data every month. In GRASS, we're doing a time series analysis. So um, we're uh, bringing the data in, registering it into um, a space-time raster data set, um, representing, for example, the, the digital surface model um, as it changes over time, um, representing the, the multispectral imagery and the derived um, the derived data sets like biomass and carbon. Um, 
we're using temporal aggregation um, to compute um, monthly and annual um, statistics in the change and temporal algebra um, to compute, for example, um, the peak in the net uh, biomass and carbon accumulation in the meadow. Um, we're visualizing this um, as point clouds. So we can show the, the bare ground in the meadow in January, for example, um, visualize it as a point cloud. Um, we can look at um, a peak in the summer, for example, um, where more biomass is accumulated. Um, and then represent, for example, uh, biomass as a 3D scatter plot on the point cloud. Um, which is derived from um, the multispectral data in the digital surface models over aggregated over time. And also the, um, the carbon. So with this, we can start to quantify things like the uh, ecosystem services provided by the meadow um, and also look at their fluctuations throughout the year. Um, the end of the presentation, there's some references if you want to learn more about the temporal framework. Um, and there's a bunch of great tutorials for this. Um, developed by uh, groups around the, around the world, um, some dealing with um, earth observation, remote sensing, um, climate data, and, and so forth. Um, so that's it for me. Do uh, you have any questions? Yeah. Oh, so for example, um, meadows can provide a lot of carbon sequestration. Um, they can develop really extensive root systems um, that store a lot of carbon in the ground and the biomass from the, when the senescent plants, when they're dying, it gets stored into the soil um, and uh, that carbon stays stored in the landscape. Um, that's that's one of the key ones. I mean, obviously they have other other ecosystem services like aesthetics, for example, uh, wildlife, and so forth. Okay. Uh, can you tell us about the gap theory? Um, A little bit more what you do there. Yeah. So um, because. Um, you know, of weather concerns. We couldn't fly, for example, on the first of every month. Um, so we, we might fly in the middle of a month if there wasn't a good, if there was bad weather for a while. Um, so our data set was a little uneven, um, even though we were flying monthly. Um, so we took the time series of data and we interpolated daily um, flight, daily values for each of the each of the the data sets, the multispectral imagery and the digital surface models, and um, created daily values and re-aggregated those into monthly values and then annual values. Uh huh. The drone platform and sensors. Uh, we had um, this is um, a Firefly Pro Six. It's a fixed wing uh, drone with vertical takeoff and landing. Um, it's got a pretty good flight time since it's a fixed wing drone. Um, we have um, for the multispectral camera. It's um, uh, Microsense uh, Red Edge MX, I think. Are you requiring 
FCC clearance for that very uncovered? No, we're flying under the under this university property and we're flying under a academic uh, Anybody else? Everybody been the Hilltop Arboretum before? All right, thank you. Thank you, Brandon. My director is going to give you guys a quick update about other resources in the city parish. After the earlier fiasco, I don't know if I want to do this. Or if y'all even trust me to do this. So I'm Eric Romero. I'm the director of information services for the city of Baton Rouge. So we handle all the, the technology for the city, the computers, the servers, the emails, and our transparency efforts, which our open data and GIS are a big uh, proponent of that. Um, all of the initiatives that I'm going to quickly run through are, you can find them on our website, brla.gov slash transparency. We'll start off with the website itself, brla.gov. So that's this is basically the front door to City Parish. Um, we did a reskinning of the site uh, earlier this year, kind of a fresh new look. Um, a lot of the same functionality, but some new functionality. Basically, we have about three or four different ways that you can find the same information. And, and the reason why that's important is because everybody searches for information differently. Some folks know what department handles permits. So they know that they can go to the departments and go to development and find um, information about permits. But other folks, uh, they're not that familiar with our internal structure, so they may use the search feature or some of the other features that we have there. Red Stick 311 is um, our 311 system, but it's the public, uh, the public side of it that allows you to submit um, 311 calls. Uh, instead of picking up the telephone, you can submit it online or through the mobile app. So these are those service request calls. Hey, I need to report a pothole, uh, um, uh, miss garbage pickup. All of those types of calls um, can be done through online, uh, the 311 app, um, or of course, calling in. What's beneficial about the app though, is that it, since it uses the location service on your phone, if it's enabled, um, we get uh, the GPS location of the of where it's being submitted from. So if you're at this pile of debris that's on the side of the road and you're taking a picture of it um, and submitting it, so now we have a picture and we have the GPS coordinate. So even if you don't have the exact address, we should be able to find it. Now, extremely easy to get the calls in the 311. Um, you know, I'm not going to say that that makes the crews go out super quick and address the issues. We are working on improving processes internally, helping our maintenance division, helping our traffic engineering folks and our development folks to use the technology to hopefully uh, respond a little bit quicker to those calls. Open Data BR, so this, this was our first uh, really the flagship of our transparency efforts. Um, so open data has uh, tabular data um, that uh, you can come in and look at completely free of charge. So this is data such as Baton Rouge Police Department crime incidents, uh, city parish employee salary, permits from the permit office, um, fire incidents, animal control incidents. There are Let's see if that's, yeah, so these are the, the top 15 directly accessed uh, data sets, adjudicated properties, extremely popular. So all of these are uh, basically tabular. So if you can imagine an Excel document, it's listed like that. You can create visualizations, you can create some mapping, um, but the GIS platform is really the, the spot to go for the mapping side. Open budget BR. It's tied to open data, so budget is all of our, the city parish budget. Um, so if you look at the budget book when they would print it out, it's about this thick, two, about two inches thick. Everything that you wanted to know if you were like an accountant about city parish finances, to the lay person, way too much information, way too much to consume. So what open budget does, it gives you a, a really easy to, to use user interface to drill down on uh, 
how we're how we're budgeting money in city parish. So if you're interested in the city in the IS department, you can find the IS department. You can click on IS and see the breakdown of what we're budgeted for. The companion app is Open Checkbook BR. So similar, but this is what we're actually spending. So budget is is what uh, the money allocated to the departments to spend each year. And then checkbook is the actual spending. So you can go in and see individual line item invoices, basically our checkbook of how much IS paid for um, the ESRI licensing that we have or the, um, the Socrata licensing, which is, runs our open data platforms and such. So anything that we put in, so uh, travel, um, apparel, anything, office supplies, all of that's in uh, checkbook and it applies to any city parish agency. So from mayor's office to council, to IS, to the police department. So completely transparent on the financial side. Open, neighbor, open neighborhood BR, also tied to open data. Um, this is a extremely easy to use interface um, to see what's going on around your area. So there's five categories that are displayed on this map. Um, the police police incidents, Baton Rouge police incidents, um, fire incidents for Baton Rouge fire, the permits, 311, and traffic incidents. So if you're interested in, in what's going on around your house, you type in your address, you can set a, a radius um, and drill down into and have all of these dots or some dots pop up similar to this. When you click on the dot, you get the detailed information. So the little blue dot is uh, crime incidents. I can click on that dot and I would see that what type of crime it was, if it was a burglary or, or uh, something like that, or hopefully not something, something worse. So it really gives you a good um, insight into what's going on in, in your neighborhood. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. Uh, GIS, the GIS portal, gis.brla.gov. Warren's gonna cover um, some advancements that we had here, but, but this is where we go to, to do any of our, uh, or to find any of our spatial data. All those uh, either PDF maps or online maps or applications that, that are using the, the spatial technology and now um, dashboards as well. So all of our transparency efforts, we put all of these tools out for public consumption and we want y'all to use them. But what we found out over the years that we've been doing this is that it's not just enough for us to make it available to you. We need to make sure that you understand how to use them. So last year, uh, we started our Citizen Data Academy uh, um, on demand series. So what these are very short videos, usually between five and 10 minutes on certain aspects of the different transparency sites. So if you wanna learn how to create a visualization in Open Data VR, you can go watch just that video. You don't have to look at a whole hour, two, two hour long video, which we used to capture in the past. These are very targeted. Every time that we release a new dashboard or app or web map, we create a companion Citizen Data Academy video. And it's it's uh, has been very well received. We've actually won a couple of awards um, for the concept this year and a lot of other municipalities are asking us about how we how we came up with the idea and how we put it together and whatnot. So the videos are on the website, brla.gov slash data academy or on our YouTube, the city parishes YouTube page. Presentations. So we are always um, open to do presentations at homeowners associations, church groups, any type of um, any type of event like that. We can do a customized presentation. So a lot of times the homeowners associations, they want uh, a little bit more insight on the whole 311 process and how, do this, how does the 311 app work? And how can I go into open data to see all the 311 tickets and those type of things? Um, other folks want to know a little bit more. Uh, we did a presentation to the IFMA, what's that? facilities management. So we concentrated that presentation. It was more Warren doing it on some of the GIS technology, uh, GI, GIS maps and data that we have. Um, so can do targeted uh, presentations, always willing to come, come out, uh, email us at isoutreach at brla.gov. 
and we can uh, work with y'all to get that scheduled. And that is it for me. So just real brief on some of those um, initiatives. Again, brla.gov slash transparency, and you can get uh, all of those and learn about some additional ones that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you uh, do the training for internal to purpose as well? Yep. So, so that is something that that's actually actually both pictures. So, so the one on y'all's left, I'm back with my directions on either side. But on the left is uh, Warren um, doing a training for the maintenance division. Yep. And then on the right is uh, training with uh, Baton Rouge Police Department. Um, so we have a an internal dashboarding system that uh, gives PD. I mean, they can slice and dice um, the uh, the crimes and the calls for service that are coming in um, all kinds of different ways by zones, by by crime types, uh, trends. It is pretty impressive. So much so that the the chief is always. Um, speaking about it, and I think you either did or you will be doing a, a presentation with another law enforcement agency, I forget where, but so we do that that type of internal training as well. Um, that's something else that, that we're trying to do better of inside the city. So again, just like we're making applications of it in, in data available to the public, we implement applications in the city and um, we're very focused on doing the direct process, whatever that, that application is, is used for, but we don't look really at the, the, we haven't looked at holistically, how can maybe that application or that data can help in other aspects of the city. So um, the way we do that is start training the employees to not just do, you know, the, the key punching in the data, but, but think about the data that they are collecting or that they need to collect to make better decisions in City Parish? Uh, yes, you had a uh, 311 app. I, yep. I was wondering how it talks to your work order management system. Is that done through the use of a REST API? So, and how does the um, app that you had all of the um, 301 calls on, for example, if you had a call, how does it talk? back to the work order management system. So, so both the app, the 311 system we have, or the, the app is developed by the company that made the 311 system. So it's not anything, it's not any REST services or anything that we provide. Quite honestly, I don't know how, how they have it integrated, um, but it is pretty much real time. If you submit it through the app, it's it's going straight into the this, uh, the 311 system, and the 311 system is uh, cloud based, so that's another benefit of it. So it goes directly in the 311 system. So um, when it goes in, then the department that it routes to is notified. But I don't I don't have particulars about exactly how the back end works. But it is all it is all integrated and seamless, and it's. It's not like a nightly import or anything like that. Else? This is amazing. How often is your crime data updated? So the crime data is updated uh, nightly. So most of the data on um, Open, Open Data BR Let's say probably 75% is updated nightly. We do have some that's updated weekly, and um, the annual employee salary is updated annually. But on on the the on the site, um, when you go to a data set, the metadata about that data um, it clearly states when the last time it's updated and how often we updated. But crime incidents are updated nightly. There is a caveat to that, though. So if a crime happens today. Well, back up. So we do not receive data from the, the record system until the supervisor has reviewed the officer's report and approved it. So we only see approved reports. So 
uh, a crime can occur today, but if it doesn't get reviewed and approved to tomorrow or the next day, it won't show up until the, the day after that, that approval happens. So that's a little, little caveat there, but we are taking updates daily into Open Data VR for that. Right. have our solutions engineer from Esri with us. You're in the San Antonio office, right, Ami? Yes. And Rodriguez is going to talk to us about ArcGIS Hub. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Warren. Everyone's doing some really cool GIS work, uh, Esri products or not, so we appreciate everyone for being here. Uh, my name is Ana Rodriguez. I am with Esri. I am a solution engineer on our state and local government team. Um, I recently joined Esri about nine months ago, but I've been doing GIS for about 12, 13 years now. I love what I do. I love that I'm here. I love that I'm seeing a lot of faces. Um, this is my first time at GIS here at Baton Rouge, um, but happy to be celebrating with you all. Happy to be celebrating GIS, some days more than others, of course, but we all wouldn't be here if we didn't appreciate what GIS can do for us. All right, so quick agenda. Uh, I'm gonna walk through a brief introduction into ArcGIS Hub, uh, what it is, how it's used. For those that are not familiar with this product, I'm gonna show you some examples of common patterns uh, of use we've seen with Hub sites, and then I'm gonna go going to round everything off with highlighting Hub Premium and those features and additional functionality that you get with, uh, with Hub Premium or with the Hub Premium subscription. So we all know there's a proliferation of digital interconnectedness in our everyday lives, right? Every community is faced with keeping up with this wave of technology and strives to become a smart community. Cities want to become smart cities by being transparent, uh, more sustainable, safer, right? A lot of, a lot of these things aren't as easy as, as it sounds. As cities evolve and grow, they are facing complex challenges. For example, information sharing is not as simple as it once was. Uh, in, involving citizens and an entire community is challenging, even with today's technology. Some organizations are faced with citizens that are or have become more and more involved in their communities, yet these organizations are not quite capable of modernizing their information sharing media, or as quickly as it's needed also. This has prompted governments to become more innovative, to disseminate information faster and provide that transparency for people, as Eric was talking about earlier. So again, making it more challenging to keep up with the pace of these, of these requirements. Over the last few years, um, Esri has listened to, to users mention this challenge frequently. Community engagement is hard, right? People are busy, we have short attention spans, and sometimes getting people to care about issues is, is just the beginning. There's also competing interests, right? So what is more, more important to me? What's more important to my community, right? Barriers to technology is something else. As we mentioned, some organizations aren't equipped to provide their community with information or up-to-date data, right? But central to all of these challenges is trust, right? The lack of trust between an organization and its community is usually the biggest challenges organizations face. And without trust, it becomes extremely difficult to achieve any goals or initiatives that have been put into place. And then there's also the lack of trust that's interdepartmental too, right? And that poses an even bigger challenges for organizations. So trust has to be earned through transparency and through using data that can support what's being communicated and shown in ways that make any initiative easy to quantify and understand. So having that authoritative, authoritative source of data, being able to use that across multiple agencies or have that community access as well to consume that data and start to build that foundation of trust. And this is how ArcGIS Hub can help. Hub can help to establish that foundation with your stakeholders, and this can include internal and external stakeholders, stakeholders of course. It can establish that two-way ebb and flow and communication between you and the people that are involved in projects uh, in order to just form that collaborative approach on each project.
So what is a Hub is a cloud-based community engagement platform. It does everything from hosting data, data sharing, to establishing information-driven in initiatives. And it does this by leveraging that broader community to work more effectively for each other. And then we maximize that engagement, we maximize that uh, communication, we maximize that collaboration. And then by broad, we do mean all and any stakeholders involved. So this can include government leaders, NGOs, your partners, the general public, your local universities, and anyone that you want to collaborate with falls into this umbrella, right, of your community in an ArcGIS hub. And this is, we've really focused on making the system very, very easy to use. It sits on top of your ArcGIS online, and you have access to it already if you have that, uh, that license. So why is this important? Why is it important to engage effectively with your community? Let's take, for example, you have a project that's being worked on in your organization. It usually involves one or more department or more than one department. And if it does involve more than one department, that staff is usually siloed, right? So how do we communicate effectively between an organization and the general public, right? It could be providing updated data, communicating timelines, communicating progress, or simply just communicating altogether to a broader audience on the project that you're working on. This is a very common pattern of engagement, but business needs are changing and it's always expanding. It's very difficult to establish that channel of communication between staff, between agencies, uh, other stakeholders, especially the public, especially when there is a public component involved, it's very difficult to get that collaboration going. So as, as we saw value in this common pattern of engagement, Right? We thought to start organizing everyone that is included on that spectrum of engagement. And this is where HUD started to evolve into more of an engagement tool instead of just like a data portal that I'm going to show you soon. So you can start to group people or the people that are involved in your projects where each group is seamless, seamlessly involved in that project life cycle. So this can include trusted collaborators that are people that you've worked with before, you've built that working relationship with them already, actively engaged people. So these are people that uh, want to work with you on a regular cadence, let's say. This could be community leaders um, or even actively interested people, right? So these are people that are genuinely interested in the progress of your work, but may not have anything to contribute to your project, right? So maybe just feedback. Again, these people can be partners, uh, perhaps students, university, LSU, that's interested in working with, with you on a local or even a global initiative. Just so much value in being inclusive with the people's level of engagement uh, and how they can contribute to your initiatives through ArcGIS Hub. So with Hub, you can start to identify your stakeholders along this spectrum, right? This level of engagement. And you use tools to engage with them. And we can, you can use tools to engage with them more effectively. So we can start to create these teams based on that level of engagement, right? So for example, your trusted collaborators and actively engaged people are two groups in your organization that will likely be working more closely together, right? Uh, therefore, we can identify that or those, those groups as a core team, and they may need more privileges and access to several sites on, or, or access to sites and data in those sites. You can assign team managers that have access to additional administrative tools and settings to edit team visibility, membership access, view access as well, and then add or delete content through that um, organization as well. So we want you to be able to organize your people, organize your content and your goals, just in a more actionable, in a, in a more achievable way as well. From there, we can start to create identities, and this is where we start to get more into that Hub Premium subscription. I'm gonna elaborate on, more on that in a few more slides, but Hub Premium will come with the community organization. Um, each member is gonna get that community identity, um, and that's going to be used to follow and contribute to your initiatives. I'm going to show you how in a second. So what are the differences exactly? So with Hub Basic, it's included with ArcGIS Online, as I mentioned. It's no additional cost. Um, it's going to allow you to create sites about any topic. Uh, it's going to allow you to create or share data. This includes the creation of open data sites. Uh, you can share sites uh, and data in three ways. So with a specific team of people, uh, within your organization, within your entire organization, or with the public as well. 
Um, there are two main patterns of use with that, um, I guess, hub basic uh, element that we've seen with our customers. The first is to inform and educate um, people on projects that they're interested in or that they're working on. So every hub site can include maps, apps, dashboards, story maps, you name it, everything that's on the left-hand side of the of this slide. The second most common pattern of use uh, for hub sites that we've seen is for open data or SDIs. Um, and transparency is the key component here, like we talked about, um, where it's almost no longer an option, right? It's the core of every functioning organization. And with open data, you can start to pull in data from, from various sources. You can make it interactive and available to the public and to your stakeholders. And that's in whatever capacity uh, that you would like them to have access to. Right, so with Hub Premium, Hub Premium is a subscription, uh, but if you haven't noticed yet, Hub Basic is mostly, it mostly involves a one-way uh, engagement. So with Hub Premium, we focus more on establishing that two-way engagement. It starts to establish more of that trust that we talked about. Um, we built in several collaboration and engagement tools uh, into the Hub Premium. It just allows for feedback. It allows for review for more involvement from your stakeholders. So it's not just you and your staff any longer. Uh, it's pulling in people from other organizations uh, to work with you more collaborative, collaboratively on those initiatives. With premium, you also have, or we've also seen two main patterns of use. Um, the first is collecting feedback and data and information. The second is, um, as we described earlier, once you start to organize your stakeholders into teams, you can then start to establish um, your levels of engagements and permissions, um, access to certain content and data within those initiatives and sites. So what is a hub site exactly? The hub site is just, a, it's, it's essentially a website. Um, every website comes with, with many layout options. Uh, they're highly customizable. You can't see that, there we go. Uh, you can have a hub site up and running in a matter of hours, right? It's very simple. Uh, what sets it apart, it's its level of content integration. Uh, if you have content in your, in your ArcGIS Online already, which most of us do, you can pull it into your hub site very easily. Uh, spatial or non-spatial content, so you can pull in, you know, tables, um, anything, images, anything, you name it, uh, URLs, right, so other websites. Um, and you can organize it in the way that's going to allow your users to interact with that content pretty easily as well. You can also include branding on your hub site. So hub comes with many configurable options for you to be able to match your custom logos, colors, fonts, um, anything custom to your organization. Hub is highly configura configurable for you to be able to do this. It also includes a navigation and site mapping tool. So we want you to uh, make your data discoverable and easy to navigate. Uh, community members need to be able to find that data and, inf and information pretty easily. That's relevant to them. So Hub includes things like pages that's going to help you uh, organize your data more effectively to, to cater to your audience. And of course, built-in analytics. Uh, analytics are going to offer a ton of insight into understanding how our engagement is either reaching or not reaching our stakeholders. And that's pretty important. You can see how many views you're getting, how many sessions, uh, the average time people are spending on your on your website uh, and even views over time, which is a cool component. This feature is still being improved on, um, but metrics, more metrics will be added with future updates. Uh, or any design language to customize your sites. It's as simple as this layout where you're dragging and dropping your elements onto your page, uh, building and designing your sites, pulling in your data, like we mentioned, uh, or content from your portal or ArcGIS Online. Uh, there are multiple layout options as well. I believe we have over 20 layout options for you to get started with. Uh, we have a survey card, a contacts card, many options to choose from just for you to have that head start uh, with that layout. Sharing controls are also uh, going to allow you to share certain parts of your site uh, for certain users within your organization or your teams.
All right, so here are a couple of exam examples that uh, have integrated their own existing site uh, with their with their hub. And then we have here sites with, you know, customized branding and logos as well. Just going to go through these pretty quickly. Going to these these next examples are just more examples of our two patterns of use that we talked about. Here you can see uh, pages from around the world. There's so many sites that have been created so far. I believe we have, they're in the hundreds of thousands now of, of ArcGIS hub sites that have been created by our users. Um, you have pages to draw from if you need ideas or inspiration. A wide variety variety examples. Uh, aren't so cons we have everything from conservation, AEC, education, sustainability, so on, you name it. Um, our gallery on our ArcGIS hub page is going to take you directly to all of these uh, examples. Uh, so if you want to learn more and just peruse more, please feel free to do that. Of course, our page, our you know, online web pages are always full of re good resources for you to get started with. Open data sites as well. Um, So this is where Hub was really conceived. Um, it was just to be used as an open data platform. As the product evolved, we have seen the product being used more as an engagement tool. So it's not just here's a ton of data uh, for you to download. It's also about here's a ton of data, but now we're telling a story or we're, we're visualizing it in a way that helps make that data more useful. So more actionable. It helps you to build that trust that we talked about between organizations uh, and the people that you're trying to engage, right? Again, citizens, donors, nonprofits, any, anyone you're trying to reach. Some of the best examples uh, we've seen do a great job of categorizing data as well. So you'll see data, data categorized uh, in, by subject matter area. Uh, other organizations organize data by projects. So maybe there's data related to stormwater or here's all the data related to streets or utilities. Uh, and then finally, of course, search catalog, so anyone can access data that cross agencies, uh, just making it easier for the public um, and a wide range of staff to, to find the data they need for their workflows. Some of the engagement tools. So everything we've shown you so far has included that one way engagement like we talked about or collaboration. Right, so using Hub to inform and educate, and then using Hub as an open data site. But what about that two engagement as well that we that we mentioned? Um, what are some of the tools that we can use to establish that two way engagement? With the additional capabilities with Premium, uh, we all know that you can create sites and pages, set up open data portals uh, with Hub Basic, and that comes with your ArcGIS on Life subscription. Uh, with premium, you're going to get several more tools and capabilities. So you can start to create and, and manage events. Now you have access to that team management system. Um, and, and we mentioned this briefly, but with premium, you're going to get that community organization. Um, it's aside from your ArcGIS online organization, um, but members again are given that community identity where they're actively engaging uh, collabor collaborati collaboratively with your hub. Uh, they can contribute content again, they can contribute information, uh, they can give you feedback, they can follow as many initiatives as you create within that hub. Lots more engagement tools with, with Hub Premium. And then for those that want to keep everything on-prem, ArcGIS sites are also available uh, and includes the same uh, capabilities as, as ArcGIS Basic or Hub Basic. Great. So what is a community identity? Um, when you activate Hub Premium, there's an additional organization like we talked about. It, it's activated alongside your AGO, right? So that is, it's going to be known, it's going to be known as your community org, and then you're also going to have your AGO, so your ArcGIS online org. Uh, you still have that um, employee organization. It's just the community org is just somewhere where your community is going to be able to share data uh, either internally or externally as well and be able to contribute. Community members have the ability to create and manage user, user profiles as well. Uh, so these are all the things that you would be able to do with a community org. Uh, you can join initiative teams, 
you can contribute content again. You could provide that feedback, follow initiatives uh, to receive updates. So let's say, you know, I want to receive updates on the city's tree inventory initiative. I would be able to do that through here. Uh, but we also want your community members to feel comfortable creating maps, right? That's also a capability they have. Uh, you know, they could create maps, applications, dashboards, even story maps just to, to help you drive that initiative forward. This is just one last graphic that, that shows an overall view of ArcGIS Hub and its, its capabilities. So I've taken you through a journey of how to create your hub sites, uh, you, how can, you can engage and collaborate with both internal and external stakeholders uh, for your projects. We've shown you differences in engagement tools uh, with Hub Basic and Hub Premium, um, but we also talked about those initiatives, right? And, and uh, that, that, that team management capacity also with Hub Premium. So I'm just gonna jump into that quickly also. So that initiative that we talked about with your hub site, um, it's just it's going to come with additional tools as well that are going to help you even more with engagement. Uh, so you're going to get that feedback and data col uh, data collection capability, where you're having your initiative members uh, able they're able to submit feedback and also par participate in any data collection efforts. Uh, you get that team management component as well, where you can assign team managers. Uh, they have access to additional administrative tools. Uh, so settings to, to edit team visibility, again, membership access, just another level of administrative tools aside your ArcGIS Online. You're going to be able to do the same with your community org. You also have performance tracking tools. Um, that's going to monitor site views as well, um, but also key performance metrics. Um, so that's going to be able to communicate progress made on those strategic outcomes uh, to the general public, public or other stakeholders also. Right. So what does a team enabled collaboration look like? Uh, a typical project collaboration is going to include your course, course staff team uh, and other departments, of course. Uh, with an initiative, you're gonna start to gain more of those followers uh, that are actively engaged in your project, in project or initiative. So those followers start to prompt more engagement. You start to get perhaps those volunteers that are now involved. And then those volunteers perhaps start to uh, reach those that are hard to reach in our community as well. So now we have those volunteers, those initiative followers, and even our community members that are now all a part of your staff community, right? So that community org. Um, and they're now directly collaborating with both your internal and your external stakeholders on projects. So it's a huge just kind of, you know, feedback loop of communication and engagement um, through these additional tools. So from these teams, uh, we can then start to build our network, right? Uh, so gathering other teams that are gonna be supporting our core team and then tailoring those capabilities of their roles and permissions uh, within that specific team. And this is just, so now you can start to co collaborate again more effectively. Your teams can create and access workspaces. This is where content can be shared among your GIS users, but also your non-GIS users as well within those workspaces. And like I said, now we just have that, like, that one shared area where people can start engaging, start sharing data, start working on data together. And again, that communication barrier, it's just improved within those teams. The great thing about all of this is just how easy it is to get started. You don't necessarily have to be a GIS user uh, to start creating a, sub, a hub site or page. So we have templates uh, categorized by different themes just to give you that head start, like I said. So anyone from any department can start building these hub sites pretty easily. Uh, we have over 36 templates. These are just a few examples of focus areas that, um, that we've seen used between our users. So anything from surveys, event capabilities, you have dashboards, those analytic capabilities, authoritative data, and that about rounds me out. I know I'm running out of time. I do want to show you some resources. This is going to be shared with you all. So again, if you want to get started with Hub, a list of resources for you as well. Um, you know, we have blog pages, tutorials, so please check those out. Those are very easy to access besides this deck. This deck, you can go to arcjshub.com and be able to access those resources as well. That's it.
Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, the reason to see have a It's like this for a while now. Um, this is the third leg of GIS Smash with them. We have this. We have this for a week. We have the basin. So we share our yards. I'm from Texas. Yeah. That's all right. That's okay. Nope. Okay. 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 Yeah. Right. Yeah. All city big the work back in. Right. City where yeah. as certain citizen, the city. city. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. That's okay. Yeah. So an initiative like that, like you said, and when it's starting from, you know, like something grassroots, right? So in the in the bottom up, let's say, uh, so to speak, I think that's gonna that that usually prompts more of that engagement, either through more volunteers, right? That communication with just your neighbor, right? Where you're 40, what was it? 4,000, exactly. So now you're pushing the city to, right? Right. So now you're forcing the city to, right, to kind of update their, their workflows as well, right? Your work, we, we want you to do something more and ArcGIS can help, right? So. We want you to be able to have those volunteers, that hard to reach community. Let's get more people involved. Now let's push the city to do something, right? I mean, you don't necessarily are going to need premium for everything. Not every initiative is going to require for a premium subscription. With, with that basic uh, you know, license that, that a lot of users already have or organizations, you can do some of that in engagement already, right? So, so just putting an initiative on a page and saying, hey, we already have 4,000 uh, volunteers that are doing this for our, our city. Let's push this out even further, and let's force the city to start right. Uh, you know, getting more more men on the, more men on the ground, more boots on the ground. Let's start to really fix this this initiative. Let's start to improve this part of our city. I think that's that starts to help with the transparency uh, component as well, right? We're, you're not doing enough for for our community, so let's let's do something more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the, the night. I'm going to run through a handful of slides just to update you guys on things that we've been doing internally within my group uh, to support City Parish, obviously, and its operations and, uh, and you, citizens. So first off, I always like to start with data. Um, because that's our bread and butter. We um, continue to improve on our procedures to make sure that the data stays current and is as accurate as possible. Our routine data management 
procedures that we have in place now, we focus, we're to the point where we're focusing on the details, trying to add more value to the data, right? And we're always looking for new ways to find, uh, to improve our efficiency in the way that we manage that data. I always say this anytime I talk to the public that we're not afraid to get an email or a phone call from somebody that says that we found an error in your data. We want that. There's millions of records of data in our, in our database. I have nine people I work with, so we need more eyes on the data. And if you report it to us, we will do the research and we will make the repairs. So please, if you see that a web map is not working, the layers aren't loading, my friend Ed Lugucki will email me on Sunday morning sometimes and say that the map's not working, Warren, and we'll fix it. So please reach out. This is all about engagement. Um, just a few things here, notable improvements that we've worked on in this past year. Um, we've taken a concerted effort to find uh, drawings and even contact apartment complex owners to pinpoint all the buildings on a large apartment complex to just make sure that we have uh, an address point on those buildings because it helps public safety responders find folks in a matter of minutes when we have that information available to them. It's all, it's all, it's all on our web maps. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. We've um, taken another concerted effort to clean up our business data. We found that we had some, some uh, issues in the procedures to keep track of that with, when we get the reports from our finance department. Uh, we had some dupl duplicate data there. We've, we've figured out how to avoid that and, and I can, uh, always have um, current business data. Around um, the spring, late springtime, representatives from the city of Zachary contacted me um, and asked, can we create a memorandum of, of agreement with the city parish for you guys to manage our GIS data for the city of Zachary? Um, we worked that out. With our, with our attorneys and their attorneys and our mayor and their mayor. Now we're updating data for the city of Zachary within our office and, and city parish. Um, Central does a great job with theirs. We don't have to worry about them. They share. We're just, we're to the point now where we just need to work with Baker and we'll really have a grip on all this and it will truly be an enterprise GIS for this parish. Our contours data, is my friend Mirto still here? He, he worked on, on this forever, it seems like, to get some processing to work so that we can get new and improved contour data. Um, I'm going to show you a screenshot of what that looks like. Uh, and last but not least, um, the data that was delivered from HNTB as part of the stormwater master plan. We now own that and we're maintaining that and improving it on it all the time. Um, I had a handful of applications that I wanted to show you screenshots of um, and encourage you to go home and check these out um, because they are, it's us being transparent with the information uh, and putting the, putting the data in your fingertips. So we have new and improved tools to work with the data. Um, those include this as listed here and I'm going to go through um, with screenshots of each one and I've, I've tried to put the URL uh, for each if you wanted to take a picture of that. Um, so you know where to find it. But this one uh, was created this summer or late spring when the city parish received lots of federal dollars from the American Rescue Plan uh, to, to fix a lot of our drainage problems, catch basins and such. So we wanted to be transparent on how that money was being spent. And uh, 20, there was 2,750 uh, projects that originated from not only 311 service request, but also from a conditional assessment uh, when HNTB's teams are out collecting the data. Um, so every Monday, um, I get a, a new uh, spreadsheet from the project management team that's overseeing all these projects, and I run a bunch of magic, you know, GIS magic, and this dashboard updates. Um, the everything you see here is interactive. The bars in the, the chart here, you touch on those and it'll it'll uh, filter the dots on the map. And if you look at the bottom down here, there's different tabs. So there's more than you see just at a glance. There's other uh, maps and uh, tabular views of all the, the, the uh, 2,750 requests and all the little details about the work that's being performed there. 
So again, this is updated every Monday. This one, I could probably take two hours to talk to you all about um, because it has been my baby since the beginning of the year. And Eric talked about the police department and the technology that they're using there internally. We have a complete, you guys are probably familiar with our, our portal where all of our public facing maps are. That's one ArcGIS online site. We have a completely separate one that's internal strictly for public safety folks. And Batteries Police Department was the first to embrace it. Uh, we have now uh, brought in the East Baton Rouge Parish Sheriff's Office, the fire department uses it, uh, EMS, all public safety. Anyway, this dashboard, I know it's just a bunch of numbers and, and red indicators up and down and such, but this, there's so much behind the scenes here, it's, it's uh, kind of mind boggling. We, to, to create the metrics that you see at the bottom, with the uh, number of homicides and, and uh, felony arrests, we had to create new procedures in the department to get this data off of, it wasn't paper, but it was almost paper, uh, into our GIS to present it to you this way. So all the metrics at the top, um, the different categories of crimes, starting with alarms and all the way down to vehicle thefts, these metrics are updated every morning on a daily basis. Uh, and these are calls for service. So when you dial 911, um, or somebody dials 911 and an officer responds and there's some you know, case number written for, and, and that becomes a reported crime, that shows up here. And the trends you're seeing, whether it's up or down, are based on the calls that have come in in those last 28 days as compared to the average 28 days over um, six months. Over on the uh, left-hand side, those trends are um, seven-day averages. So you can see when I took this screenshot, unfortunately, violent calls for service are trending up right now, but property calls for service are down, right? And then the finally, um, last thing I'll say about this was there's um, numbers on the bottom, starting with the homicides, the negligent. So the first number is actual homicides. The second number would be the negligent and justifiable homicides. These uh, and all the way across to the firearms being seized are updated on Mondays, so just once a week. Remember I mentioned we had to create processes to get that data? That's why it's only weekly. I believe next week there's going to be a social media or maybe a press release about this, but you're seeing it. It's already publicly available. Chief Paul was behind this. It started with a, he gave me a spreadsheet from Jefferson Parish's Sheriff's Office. He said, can you put this kind of spreadsheet on the internet for me? I said, Chief, I think we can do better than that. This is it. All right, the third one is a dashboard. This one's actually still internal right now, but there's going to be a public facing component to this at some point in time. Our Department of Development took on a very ambitious project to get a leg up on addressing blight. And they, we created a, uh, a field map for them to go out with their inspectors um, three days a week, starting at the north part of the parish, working their way south, to go house by house looking for blighted property. Uh, and they have this whole scoring system, you know, and basically, they're able to pinpoint which properties need attention now, you know, soon, uh, or those that are maybe it's just tall grass and they just need to contact the property owner and say, hey, you need to, call, you need to cut your grass or we're going to put a weed lean on your house. So, um, again, this hasn't made it to the public facing component yet, but um, amazingly, these guys, when they started the north part of the parish and said they were going to finish it by the end of the year, I was like, no way. Um, but they already have made it down to the Shenandoah, um, Old Jefferson part of the parish now, so I think they're going to do it. Uh, and then they'll have this inventory, this snapshot in time of what, what does blight really look like. Because in the past, we were just relying on citizens to report it through 311, and you don't get the full picture that way. So. Um, this is the drainage and flood zones web app that I know a lot of people use because they want to see if they're in a flood zone or not, but I bring this one up specifically because it shows the new contour data. 
Um, in the past, so I'm zoomed in at LSU on the camp, main campus, and right in the middle of the screen, you can see these two uh, series of concentric circles there. That's the uh, ancient Indian mounds on campus. The previous contour data that we had from 1999, uh, LIDAR data, those Indian mounds didn't even show up. So you can see how much higher resolution the data is now. So if you need to look at contours, we have it. And this is one of the maps for you to use. Um, the other one that it's shown on is our stormwater management web app. This one is really neat. My uh, Mickey, who started out our night in the presentations, since he's come on board, um, we've been able to have uh, Mickey geo-reference all of our historic scanned imagery. Um, not all of it, he's working on it, but uh, this one that you're seeing in this historical maps and imagery web map is from 1941. It's the oldest known imagery that we have for East Baton Rouge Parish. Uh, it covers the whole parish. Obviously it's not that high resolution, but it's pretty cool looking at parts of the city and just how rural Baton Rouge was only 75 years ago. Um, so when Justin and I used to work at the Planning Commission, one of the projects we took on way back then was to scan all this old imagery. It was photo, right? Like, the size sheets. We scanned it, but we never had the time to geo-reference it and, and then publish it like this. So thank you, Mickey, for doing this. Uh, we're going to have 1940, well, we have 41, we have 1953, 1958, you're working on 1968. We're going to have imagery for every decade starting in 1941 before long. And I've asked Mickey if or maybe somebody in this audience tonight could take this and maybe do some sort of, I don't know, a classification of some sort, uh, comparing, comparing the, um, you know, as the city grew and the, and the way that the land was developed. Take a look at this, it's really neat. Also, before I move on, um, I would mention that just the other day, our current imagery updated. Uh, when you use our maps, you can change the base map layer and uh, uh, there's a layer called near map, and it was showing the January flight. Now it shows the October flight, and what's really neat is you can see that uh, ferry that's exposed out here on the Batcher, uh, if you zoom in close enough. And the last dashboard I'll talk about is um, one that we created to keep track of usage of our data and our apps. Um, this one, too, is public now. Uh, it helps us understand inside the office what are, you know, we think something's really neat, but are people using it? So that's how we're using um, these uh, analytics to help us figure out maybe where we need to spend more time developing apps um, and, you know, or, you know, uh, also we have a dashboard that's not shown, but you can switch down here to the bottom, the videos and the Citizen Data Academy, how many views those get. And then, and then um, our open data VR platform as well. So that was apps. I talked about data. Now I want to just go through some examples of the support that our office gives to other departments within City Parish to help them make data-driven decisions. Um, again, the ARP drainage projects were De defined using 311 citizen request data and a conditional assessment that the field crews made when they were surveying the data. That's how we presented our plan to the federal government to say this is how much money we need, here's what we're going to fix. Um, I've mentioned blight. We know we have a blight problem in this parish. We um, are part with the Bloomberg philanthropies. Um, not, or certified us as a what works city last year and they, they come out with this new thing called a data alliance where they guide you on how to develop a performance management plan to see if the things that you're doing are really working so they chose we were one of the uh, 40 cities across North and South America that were chosen and they're we're in the infant stages of this but they're helping us look at all this different these data points around blight and how we can 
resolve this matter in our parish. I'm going to talk really quickly about this next one uh, because it didn't go so well when it was presented, but the impervious surface data that was used to do the stormwater utility fee calculations, that data was uh, developed in our office. Um, but I will say this, it was based on 27 imagery, 2017 imagery at a one meter resolution. So it was, it was accurate, but it just wasn't precise. So what we're doing now is actually going in and hand digitizing all the concrete and sidewalks. And I, my coworker dreams of digitizing vertices at night when she's sleeping. Uh, the next one here is about purchasing. Who would have thought that we'd create a GIS application for our purchasing department? Well, we did it. And realized that it, there's no spatial data involved, but they realized that the dashboard technology that we have we pull that data in from another system, present it in the dashboard, and they're able to see maybe where there's a choke point in the um, approval process to, to get a purchase order out. And then last but not least, most recently, the thing I worked on with the maintenance department is figuring out um, how to optimize the street sweeping operations. We only have two street sweepers for this entire parish. Um, and downtown gets swept quite a lot, but we have thousands of miles of roads that need to be swept. So we're recording, we have maintenance, street sweeper drivers using GIS to record what they drove and swept. And when they have inventoried all of the routes that they know up here, we're going to sit back, look at that, and optimize the routes for them, and then make sure they're not missing streets, which I think they are. But uh, maintenance departments taking strides to use data to help them get more efficient. Um, quickly about collaborating um, with the ArcGIS online site that we have, we're able to, I, I mentioned it before, like with the public safety group, we've now brought in the sheriff's office, we're collaborating online to share data. Uh, the DA has a part in that. Uh, we share data with the assessor, the assessor has their own site but they get a lot of the other map layers that's in that site from us. We collaborate with the Baton Rouge Water Company because they own all the hydrants and the fire department needs to know where the hydrants are. So there's through web services consuming their data. Um, the airport and last but not least Baton Rouge Green. Baton Rouge Green has, um, is in the process of migrating from one platform to another in order to make it easier for uh, city maintenance workers to know where all the street trees that they have to maintain are. Um, so there's a lot of collaboration going on behind the scenes. Eric talked about this earlier. I just want to say it again. We developed over 25 little short videos on how to use our tools. Um, please check those out. You'll, you'll, I, I learn things when Michael makes those yeah, just from going through all the little steps that he does to, to um, make sure it's very clear and concise. And lastly, um, recognition. This has been a really good year. Um, our innovation, people are watching and uh, that helps because when somebody sees the work that you've done and they, uh, you know, they, they offer some um, feedback, it helps you become even more innovative in what you do. Uh, We've won two awards just for the Citizen Data Academy this year, the Charmin Stein Award for Storytelling. Uh, that was from uh, Bloomberg. Yeah. We were the national award winner for that. And then right after it, like two weeks later, uh, GovX awarded us uh, again for um, outreach, right? Or something, yeah. It was also for the Data Academy. So like within two weeks, we won two awards for our Data Academy. And then just last week, uh, it was announced that we are now the, um, we're back at number three, digital city for mid-sized cities in America. Um, and this is the eighth year in a row that we've made the top 10. I kid you not, that application process was a beast. So they, it's pages upon pages of it questions that they ask that we have to answer, so it's exhaustive, but it's, so it's really rewarding to be recognized like that. That's it.
before, before we get to questions, let me just, I, I want to shout out to Warren and the GIS team. I want to recognize some. So in the back corner over here, Allison, Lynn, and Inda, um, JP, Justin, uh, Murto actually was a former employee, Mickey, uh, who presented, Michael, did I miss anybody? So, so there is, Warren, we didn't mention, how, how old is the GIS program? That we 29. Said? 29 years. So that's 29 years of collecting data. The reason why we're able to do all of this technology is because of the data. The reason why we have good data is all these folks sitting in the basement of City Hall every day, putting data in, correcting data. It's, it's not glamorous, but it is so important because the reason why those apps are so successful and so useful is because of the quality of the data. And just want to throw the shout out to them. Anybody have a question? I'll bring you the mic. Just a quick comment. I think that was a pretty impressive uh, presentation and you were able to very well summarize what you do, even for people like me who are interested in that. Thank you. Very welcome. Uh, well, first, thank you very much for this um, space. Um, I have a question. Uh, does the program collaborate with any state um, agency and how? Yes, we are right in the middle of a process working out, uh, working out a process with uh, Louisiana DOTD. Uh, they have a statewide road and highways network uh, data set and they recognize that because there's like a, a million roads unique roads in our state. They recognize they don't have the manpower to manage that themselves, so they need local governments to contribute. So we're, we're refining the process where that's, we're sharing data with them through services, no exports and wallet or any of that. And it trans, the process translates from the way that we store the data to the way that they store the data. It seems. Anybody else? Yeah, that's another good one. Um, GOSA, Governor's Office of Homeland Security Emergency Preparedness, uh, has an ARC GIS online organization. And so when we forget hit by a storm and the citizens report the, the kind of damage that they had, um, it's submitted to the state actually, but then we're able to consume it here within our own local emergency operations center. So how many parishes have this GIS within Louisiana and are any of you all collaborating together? Okay, um, Andrew? <laughs> it's prevalent, right? I mean, there's lots of GIS. Uh, at a parish level, I would say most of them, but I would say even if at the parish level they're not doing it, at least one municipality in every parish is doing it, I would say. Yeah, the assessors, definitely almost all, if not all, just the four, six, four assessors are doing GIS and keep track of parcel data. As far as the, the question, uh, are we collaborating with other parishes? I mean, we're collaborating with the other three cities in this parish. Um, we do have a relationship across the river over there, West Baton Rouge, uh, because of 911 calls for service. But, uh, yeah. So at the state level, we do look at data standards for parishes and cities to, to be able to coordinate projects and data. So at the state level, we do talk about that in order for if someone's new to GIS, you know, how do you structure data and how does it look like? So there is some of that work being done too. Anybody else? Okay, 
everybody enjoy themselves. Thanks everybody for being here.